Good morning and welcome to issue number 12. Uh, today the topic is why. So what does that mean? So it's interesting, you know, I was reading uh, Tim Ferriss's book the other day. I'm not sure which one it is. It's either Tribe of Mentors. I think that's probably it, but I'm not certain. But the point is, is that he, he talks about a guy in there whose, um, whose thing to do with people is to ask them why three times. So if you tell me what's going on with you, something that's happening in your life, something that's bothering you, and then you have someone say, well, why? Or ask yourself, why? Why is that the case? And it's not a restatement of the facts. It's, a, it's, it's more of a what underlies the facts that you've just said. What underlies those feelings? What underlies those feelings and what underlies those feelings? It's the why, why, why statement, right? What is the basis of this information? And so I was having a discussion last week about, uh, about trial preparation and about uh, figuring out the manner in which to present a theory and theme of a case, right? And so if I'm telling a story, if I'm telling someone a story, and essentially trial attorneys are storytellers, right? I'm, I, I tell people all the time, I am in fact a professional storyteller, right? It's what, it's what I am. It's what I do. And so if I'm telling a story and I, and I want you to understand this story and I have a theory of my case, right, that includes innocence, I have a theme of my case, right? There's a theme to my case which includes what's happening but the larger picture, the sort of context within which the theory happens, right? What are the secondary players? What are the witnesses doing? What are the emotions and the feelings and the interrelationships between the people? You know, how are all those things affecting how the story is being told from both sides? But then there's another level, right? There's another level of storytelling that appeals to what it is that's fundamentally good about telling stories, right? About the fact that stories, um, f the stories are formulaic to some degree, right? Hollywood filmmaking is formulaic, right? There's a, there's a, a story, a hero, right? And then an antagonist, and then there's a conflict between them, and the hero finds a, a victory, but then struggles and has a defeat, right? And it looks like the hero isn't going to make it, but then the hero overcomes, right? By, by reaching deep and finding that one true meaning and in that true meaning, that true place, that's where they find real victory, right? Even though they had what seemed to be a victory at first, that eventually led to defeat. It wasn't until they found their true purpose or true uh, uh, meaning that they found the actual victory, right? And so Hollywood stories are written this way, right? There's this story that occurs of a bunch of facts and relationships, but there's an underlying sort of uh, meta story or, or a story that's greater than the story above, right? The, the sort of factual interplay into relationship story. <clears throat> Jury trial work is essentially the same, right? There's another story being told. There's a story about good and bad or good and evil and a story about, um, you know, about uh, criminals and district attorneys, about prosecutors and defense attorneys, about, about right and wrong, right? About, um, about safety and about fear and courage. You know, there's some real fundamental fundamental precepts going on inside this discussion, inside this jury trial work, right? So when we're telling our stories to juries, when we're telling our stories to people, we have to, we have to realize that there's this other story going on. And it's, it's oftentimes unconscious, the story. Um, neither party is, is a part of that story, but they're interpreting the, what they're hearing through that story. I mean, this occurs in sales, right? And you're trying to sell someone an automobile, for instance, you're a car salesman, and you're telling someone about this car, right? Well, you're telling them the facts. You know, you're telling them uh, the car is very safe and it's got this safety rating and it's got these four doors and all the windows go down, up and down automatically and the, and the lights adjust when the car turns, the lights turn in front of it so that the road is lit when you make a turn. And all these things are great. These are great facts, right? And some of those are related to safety. Some of those are related to comfort. Some of those are related to aesthetics, right? It has this really cool big uh, sunroof that you can open up this entire car. But there's, there's another story going on, right? And then the other story going on is about how that person feels about being in this car, right? There's a story that is personal, that's emotional, and that, and that speaks to the base of who, what this person is experiencing. Why do I know this? So I bought my first really, you know, what I thought was an expensive car five years ago. And I recall I had, I had looked at this car for about a year and a half on the internet. I had I was driving a car that wasn't worth 
one fifth of the value of the car that I was buying. And and I and this was after I was already an attorney, and I, this was a really big purchase for me, and I was really freaked out about it. But for me, it had become a symbol of my success. It had become a symbol of my achievement being an attorney. And so when I went to buy this car, even though the, the car guy was telling me about all these features and things, and they were cool, and I really liked them, you know, there was a much, much more deep and in interesting story going on with me, which was about how I felt about me as a human being and about what I would feel like to, to go home and put my kids in the car and have my sons see this car and think, man, you know, dad's doing pretty good, you know. He was right. You know, working hard and going to school, man, it really pays off. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, those kind of things, right? There was a, a pride that was there, right? There was me driving down the road feeling good about being in this car and feeling like I had accomplished something in my life, you know? And I know that's crazy, right? All tied up into a car. But that's just the truth of what was going on with me at the time of purchase, right? And so even in, this, even in something as, as, you know, as, as meaningless as a car purchase, you have all of those feelings going on. And so when I'm telling a story about someone's life and liberty, I mean, when I'm talking to a jury about freedom and liberty and justice, those underlying stories are powerful. They're powerful and they consume people. And the people and the, and the jurors are going to come into those moments with these powerful stories hardwired into their bodies, right? About, about justice and about freedom, but also about criminals and people who are on trial and people who've been arrested, right? Or people who have previously committed crimes, right? And so all those stories have to be, you have to be aware of those stories and you have to address those in ways that are, that are intelligent, right? You have to address those in ways that aren't obvious, right? You can't just sort of start talking about them because then that just solidifies a person's position, right? You have to frame and this is beyond that sort of, that, that second frame we were talking about. This is the third frame, right? This is the third frame. You have to frame the story being told in those feelings and ideas and thoughts, those basic feelings of peace, those basic feelings of safety, those basic feelings of, of what it means to, to have been arrested or falsely arrested or falsely accused, and to adopt some of those thought patterns and belief tokens so that the jury understands not, my client is innocent until proven guilty. All right, what does that mean? Okay, yeah, I get that. I get that up here, right? I get that. Well, my client's innocent until proven guilty because that's what the Constitution says. He comes in here with a clean slate. All right, now you're putting it in context. I'm starting to get that a little bit, right? That's starting to make a little bit of sense, right? But then what if I tell you a story? What if I tell you a story about being falsely accused of something? What if I talk to you about what it would feel like to have someone accuse you, a teacher. You're in the ninth grade. You're a freshman. You're sitting in your math class. And a teacher got your homework done. You hand in the, the homework grades, and the teacher says, well, you know you've done none of your work here. This is a story that happened in my life. You've done none of your work here, and I told you to do the work. And I said to the teacher... I didn't have to do the work. It's algebra. It's easy. I just wrote the answers. And she said, no, you didn't. Said, yeah, I just wrote the answers down. I, said, I, mean, what, what, I mean, this is not a difficult problem. And so the teacher wrote some problems on the board and made me solve them. Of course, I solved them immediately without doing the work. And then she got very, very angry with me. Very angry, as though I had insulted her. And she dressed me down in front of the entire class. Now, I'm a freshman. I'm, I'm, I am a little kid at this time. I'm not big like I am today. I was a small freshman. Um, I believe at this time, it was before my birthday, so I was 11 years old. 11 or 12 years old, freshman in high school. And I was, I was freaked out, you know. I felt terrible that she was doing this in front of all these people. In this math, I was in this advanced math class with all these uh, juniors and seniors. And... And at the end of this five-minute insult barrage, right, of me lying and me not being a good person, she sent me to the principal's office. And as I walked to the principal's office, I remembered crying. I remembered being really, really sad about it because I felt like I couldn't do anything. I felt like, you know, here was this teacher accusing me of lying to her and accusing me of making things up, and I had no way of stopping that. 
I knew that I was going to get to the principal's office and, and that she was going to show up and tell the principal I'd lied to her and embarrassed her in the class in front of the class and made her look like a fool because that was her story about what had happened. And I remember feeling powerless and feeling like I cannot do anything about this. I can't fix this. I can't talk my way out of it. I can't, I can't yell or scream or write a book or a poem. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't express myself in a way that was going to overcome what the teacher said about me. And that's a very difficult position to be in. All I wanted at that time was for someone, someone to help me, someone to speak for me, someone to tell my side of the story and to tell the truth about what it was that had happened from my perspective. That's all I wanted. And, and I would ask the jury, do any, of you, do any of you ever had an experience like this where you felt like you were being, you know, like you were, like something was happening to you and you were just like, bam, you know, okay. So at the end of the day, that's, that's pretty straightforward, right? I mean, that's pretty obvious what I'm doing right there, right? And I, and I wouldn't tell that story in that context for the purpose of, of, of talking about those feelings at that time, right? Because the jury would immediately pick up that I'm trying to equate it to the defendant. and you know, so, so, so the stories that I share, the metaphors I use in a jury trial aren't that shallow. I've never told that story in a jury trial, even though that's a true story for me. I've never told that story in a jury trial because it is so shallow, right? It is so sort of obviously what what's happening but but it but it makes the point of I'm trying to tie into the stories I tell right the stories I tell of my life or the stories that I know to tell of uh, the manner the, the way to get the juries to understand in that emotional framing kind of way what it is that we're going through here what are we doing why are we talking about liberty why are we talking about freedom? What it really means to be innocent until proven guilty. And why a defendant has to enjoy that privilege. Why a defendant has to enjoy that right. That right to be found, to be treated as innocent before proven guilty. And what that means. Why that's significant in the criminal justice system. And why that's significant in that courtroom on that day with that particular defendant. And so... As I sit here, that's what, that, what, that's what to me makes a difference, right? How are we asking why, why, why? How are we asking those questions of ourselves? How are we asking those questions of our cases in jury trials? How are we getting to that sort of base level operation of people as we talk to them and we tell them these stories, do we tell them these, um, our theory of the case, our themes, our theories, and how we get them to understand those themes and theories in a way that's meaningful to them so that it's not just a bunch of words, so that it's not just a bunch of talking from a slick attorney trying to be cool, but it connects with people on a human level. I want to be sure, I want to be sure to say that a bullshit story will be taken as bullshit. There are few bodies of people <laughs> better at smelling crap than a jury. If your story is not authentic, if it's not about who you are, if it's not truthful, you will fail at this. It must be authentic. That is absolutely central to this point. If, if you attempt to tell a story that is, that's a load of shit, if you attempt to tell a story that's not true or that's embellished or you manufacture, it's, you see it like this. Because you're exposed, right? You're just standing there in front of the jury like, boom, here I am. It's me. All wide open, all everybody looking at you, everybody waiting for you to make a mistake. And if you do that in a way that is un inauthentic, unauthentic, not authentic, <laughs> then jurors will see right through it. And your credibility is the first and only thing you have in front of a jury. You must maintain your credibility, right? That's another discussion altogether. But, but to tell these stories, to tell these kinds of stories, to get jurors thinking on the right terms, to get them thinking in terms of how this process works, right? It's a strange process. You must be authentic in that why. You must be authentic in those stories. And so that's simple as well. So that's all I have today. Thank you for watching the issue. I really appreciate you being here. And we'll see you guys tomorrow.